Thing. I've been finishing, I've nearly finished Gomorrah, this book by um, Roberto Saviano. This book right here, right? You guys familiar with Gomorrah? It's a really cool book. So this book is essentially um, an expose into the Italian mafia, something that a lot of people weren't really aware of, uh, especially the Naples, the Naples, yeah, Naples on the Politan, the Politan based mafia. Yeah. So essentially, um, Roberto Saviano, an investigative journalist or writer, basically infiltrated um, this underground world, was able to write this amazing thorough book on them, which then span out to a TV series. It's out now on Sky Atlantic, maybe one of the best um, mob TV series of all time, maybe ever. All in Italian, all in um, local Neapolitan slang, very dark, um, um, very complex stories, loads of interesting um, storylines going out throughout the whole series, something that I, that I really do encourage you guys to check out. Um, and the book's amazing, right? The book's even better than the TV series, of course, it's the original source material. But having read this book, it got me thinking about this issue that's happening nowadays with these um, new woke films, right? Have you heard of this whole common adage on social media now about go woke, go broke? This idea behind it is that a lot of these production companies are very much um, are trying to steer the films in the direction of um, ideology in the terms of wokeness, in the terms of you know identity politics. So they're aligning themselves with feminism, LGBTQ, LGBTQ stuff, trans, um, anything that's happening in society. Now, any article that you maybe see on BuzzFeed. Um, you know, bemoaning the state of comedy or whatever it may be, or chick complaining about chick play, all that sort of stuff, right? They're trying to get all those messages, all those themes, and all those motifs, and implant them into movies. And the issue is that sometimes, as you guys are aware, I'm not the biggest movie buff in the world, but I do know that the moment you try to um, impose a message, a takeaway, an ideology into a theme, into a movie, sorry, is the moment the movie goes. Whoosh, because essentially the reason why movies are what they are is about great storytelling, right? It's about being able to tell a story cinematically in a way that connects with a lot of people. And if it happens to have an underlying message, so be it. But the fundamental requirement of making a good movie is it needs to be a good movie. Forget the message, forget the political overtones, forget the diversity of the cast and all that, whatever. Try and make a good movie and then fill in the blanks. I think this is maybe a reaction to this, you know, you remember when... Um, Scarlett Hansen was cast as a like I forgot what movie that was, but Scarlett Hansen was basically cast in a movie that should have that's originally based on an anime, and obviously everyone in the anime is Japanese, and she was cast in this role for this movie. It made no sense at the time. The movie kind of bombed and went out, you know, in and out of cinema. And I think because Hollywood has been so crap with how they represent people on the big screen, you know, you don't really see. It's not, you know, I, I think a lot of I wouldn't say even marginalized. I say a lot of people who aren't your quintessential your kind of, you know, bog standard Hollywood looking person, attractive, whatever, maybe very fit. They probably don't see themselves reflected in the cinema. Now, that's another question as to should you be reflected in cinema? Should you be reflected in art? Is Can art just stand alone as what it, exactly what it is? If you're in a reflection of life, you just have to go out in the streets and look around. You see everyone, you know, wherever you can see someone that looks like you or it has the same background as you. But there is this idea sometimes that cinema doesn't take enough chances they rely too heavily on, you know, everything trying to become a blockbuster. Not every movie is meant to be a blockbuster. Not every movie is meant to be, you know, grossing $1 billion at the box office that Joker has, right? And that's a bit of an anomaly. Some movies should be able to just exercise the creative side of it and also serve as a platform to kind of give other actors a chance to kind of blow up and become the next big thing because production companies are very wary to give new actors or new actresses a role, but they are quite cool in an idea that as soon as you can prove you can perform on the big screen and you can also, you know, sell hard tickets and get bums on seats. They're just going to use you again. They just, want, they just don't want to take the risk first. So what would be cool if that like, that movie that Scarlett Johansson was in, that she um, got cast as like a Japanese woman, it would be cool to just get someone else in because it's a movie that no one really cares about for the most part. It is specifically geared towards a sci-fi audience. I think it's a sci-fi or anime or fancy audience. So it's a very small niche audience. But they're the loudest advocates of the movie, right, of the franchise, because they're fans of it. So if you actually cast the right person for it, maybe get someone that's unknown, give them a platform to grow, it's only going to get bigger from there, right? You look, you look at the, um, you look at Moonlight, for instance. The actors in Moonlight essentially were given a platform, not very well known. Some of the actors in The Wire is a good example. A lot of the kids in The Wire were kids that are basically on the street. A lot of guys that hadn't acted before 
but they were given a platform and then they were able to kind of use that platform to then get other things, right? But production companies were never going to give them the first job. They were needed one person to do it first. So that's probably why we now have films like Scarlet, I mean, sorry, um, Charlie's Angels coming out and maybe the Ghostbusters with the girls in it, where it's mostly political. It's mostly an exercise in identity politics as opposed to a good movie. You have this idea you, a diverse cast is going to be the ticket to making sure people get bums and seats. But the, not, the reality of the situation is, much like the Louis C.K. stuff, with you know most of his tour is now sold out, especially his world tour that he's going on, the reality is that most people don't really care about what people are complaining or arguing about on social media. For us that are plugged in onto the internet and our cultural commentators, it must be you know the thing that's at the front of your mind. But for the common, average day folk, they don't really care. It might impact them further down the line. Don't get me wrong, we're maybe fighting a good fight here. But for them, they just want to see a good movie, right? Um, cinema already is, an, is a lot of money as it is. Um, you know, if you're going on a date with somebody, let alone if you're going to take a family, it's going to be insane. But if you're going on a date or you're taking out a friend or you're meeting up a group of friends, you know, you could easily spend 50 quid going to watch a movie in a cinema, especially if it's something that you actually want, enjoy, and you want to, you know, partake in the snacks, and you're not going to sneak snack in, snacks in, sorry. You're going to buy a drink, buy a burger, maybe get some uh, chocolates, or whatever it may be. You're easily, easily um, approaching 30 to 50 pounds um, before a movie's even started. So people are more aware and conscious of that. And then also there's too much competition, right? Netflix and all this sort of stuff, and all these other streaming platforms are out. Disney Plus is now debuting. Hulu is doing real good things. Amazon Prime is slowly but surely finding its feet. You can't rely on identity politics to get bums and seats. It has to be a good movie. It has to be a, a reason for you to go there. Like movies work in the same way that Breaking Bad did, right? I didn't watch Breaking Bad for the longest period of time, but throughout the whole time I didn't watch Breaking Bad, I, I don't think a month went by, I don't think a month went by where somebody didn't tell me you have to watch Breaking Bad. Like you get a conversation about a TV series that you watch and you're like, oh, what do you watch? And they talk to you and, and they tell you, oh, have you watched Breaking Bad? Like, no. And they keep advocating for it. And that's essentially what movies are, right? So the more you able to create a good movie, the more the actual word spreads. But again, too much identity politics involved. But then it got me thinking, why can't some of these directors who are firmly in identity politics field, right? Similar to this lady here who directed the Charlie's Angels, I think, um, French um, movie that just came out recently. Where is it? Can I find it? Yeah, here it is. So there's this lady. It's an article from BuzzFeed, right? I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with this. So this lady, Elizabeth Banks, directed Charlie's Angels. And it's, a bit of, it's been a bit of a box office flop, right? And she's kind of wearing it on her. You know, she's kind of, you know, being cool about it and saying that she's proud of her work. It didn't go down as it needed to be, but maybe she probably sees it as like, you know, she's the first person over the hill making a very um, overtly feminist, um, you know, um, laden film. And maybe it didn't work out, but hopefully over time, once society catches up, you know, it could work out, which is, you know, a bit of a loaded um, explanation of things, but you know, you have to do what you have to do. So this article from BuzzFeed, it says the following, um, in case you missed it, the new Charlie's Angels premiered this weekend. Unfortunately, it's not doing so well at the box office, earning just 8.6 million in North America in its first three days. Um, but Elizabeth Bank, who wrote that produced and directed and acted in a reboot, had some choice words about the movie's box office failure on Twitter. Um, well, if you're going to, she says here in the tweet, she says, well, if you're going to flop, uh, let's get rid of this, make sure I don't go another page. So yeah, if you're not going to, so it says here, well, if you're going to flop, make sure your name is on it at least, uh, times four, right? I'm proud of Charlie's Angels and happy it's in the world, which is, you know, which is what you want really as an artist or as a creative. For the most part, you don't really concentrate on the numbers. You never should be really numbers, uh, focused. You should be concentrating more on the art, but unfortunately, because she wasn't conscious of the numbers, another thing took its place, and it was the ideology, right? The, this need to have a cast of badass women who are kind of, you know, occupying different aspects of the in, of the intersectional intersectional lines or whatever I mean, right? Uh, pivots or points, whatever they may be on the chart. And again, it just takes away from it being a good movie. Charlie's Angel, there's loads of real room for it to be a good movie, especially nowadays, especially with the need for different kinds of representation. But it doesn't need to be so heavy on the politics and the identity politics because it just, it just um, puts people off. It's as simple as that, really. Um, not because people are not um, willing to listen to your message or they're not woke or culturally aware or or you know or plugged into the internet or activism and stuff it's not because of that it just turns people off it just puts them off it's simple as that really and again the last thing you want in the movie is to be reminded about how shitty the world is you kind of want a bit of escapism i would say and some entertainment as well if you could sprinkle it in there it continues in an interview with um, Harold's son 
Elizabeth Bank wrote frankly about the movie's box office challenges and why she hopes people will get to go to see it. Look, people have to buy tickets to this movie too. This movie has to make money. If this movie doesn't make money, it reinforces the stereotype in Hollywood that men don't go to see women in their action movies, which is obviously an absolutely asinine and ridiculous statement to make. You know, you look at what Gal Gadot did with um, Wonder Woman and you look at, um, was it Wonder Woman, right? Is it Gal Gadot Wonder Woman? Is she Wonder Woman? Yeah, I think it's Wonder Woman, right? Uh, Wonder Woman and then Captain Marvel of course was a little bit less of a good movie but still two pretty decent female led movies and I think even the movie recently Anna I think it didn't do that well in the box office but that looked really cool I like the trailer of that I think I downloaded it actually I still haven't watched it yet but that looks really awesome there's a lot of kind of female led movies that are out there that are really cool but again number one is just it's, there's an assumption out there that you need to have a female lead that's quick, like a kind of a copycat of Arnold Schwarzenegger kicking ass right you don't really need to have that. I get the need for it to show women that are strong, but that's not really necessary. Um, and even if it is necessary, just do it in a cool and entertaining way and we'll go watch it. I've watched Angel Has Fallen, all the Fallen series, right? Um, well, yeah, I don't know. There's loads of them in that kind of... And fucking, it's, I think it's signed on for like five more or something, right? Insane amount of... Uh, uh, in that franchise. I watched Mission Impossible, James Bond, um, even uh, John Wick, right? These movies are not... Um, anchored in reality there's nothing real about one guy being able to take out a whole army of men no, nothing, nothing nothing happens like that in real life so this idea that guys won't go to see women in leading roles in action movies because it's not really believable isn't true it just needs to be a good movie it's a good movie like kill bill it will work simple as that and this idea that the reason why people are not watching it or men are not watching it is because they don't want to see other women succeed on the big screen is really really dumb and also it then goes to go reinforce why people wouldn't want to watch the movie because you come across just weird, isn't it? Like you're trying, you're already judging me because I don't want to watch the movie because it just looks terrible from the trailer. Not because it's got three women that are kicking ass on it, because the three women that are leading Child's Angels are all, are all awesome. Right? I'm a big fan of Kirsten. Um, what's her name? The girl that recently came out and said something about her being self partnered. I quite like her. She's really cool. She's really quir quirky. She's obviously got a bit of her own personality. She's not a very boring Hollywood type. And she's just a bit, I don't know, she's a bit counterculture. I quite like how she is as a person and how she carries herself. Obviously, she's an amazing actress. So why wouldn't I go see these people on the big screen? It needs to be a good movie, though. So anyway, um, this is this keeps rambling on. It's a common history, common story. Does this go over it again? You guys know the movie hasn't gone well. But I'm reading Gomorrah. And in Gomorrah, there's this amazing, there's several amazing um, female heroines or female capos, uh, leaders of clans who have been profiled in this book. And they do it, and again, maybe it's an Italian thing, maybe it's a European thing, but um, this, um, you get the idea that the women that are involved in the mafia use their femininity as a positive, as, as, a, as an asset. They use the fact that they could allure, they could seduce, they could convince, they could coerce, sometimes manipulate people to their advantage. Like, it wasn't as if, like, these women in this book, Gomorrah, went out and started shooting people point blank in the head. They were able to kind of amass their power and their influence and control in other ways, right? In the in the ways that maybe would suit their temperament or their personality more. And it was done in a very clever and interesting way. Um, there's a couple of stories here that are really cool that I think would work amazing on the big screen, right? There's this uh, lady in here called Anna Mazza, who, right, number one, who is flipping awesome. Um, I think she actually was murdered. I'm pretty sure a couple of them aren't alive anymore. But there's interesting stories about these female capos um, leading the mafia, especially or the clans, especially when their husbands or their partners who are leading the clans go into prison or are arrested or are you know indicted for something or on the run. They then take control of it, and the uh, the difference in how they manage and how they operate them is just amazing to see. So this is amazing woman here, right? Anna Mazza, I got them on. I got I got it on screen here. Who was one of the capos? And then there's another one called Papita, uh, Popeta Maseka, right? Who unfortunately passed away. But just look at this bio, right? Um, Aswanta Maseka, better known as Popeta, is a former beauty queen who became a well-known figure in the Camorra, which is the Italian gangs, right? She made the international newspapers headlines in the mid 1950s when she killed the murderer of her husband in revenge. So imagine how amazing of a story that is. You've got somebody who represents the absolute pinnacle of like your your kind of, you know, general everyday idea of, of womanhood or femininity in terms of being a beauty queen, but also has this sharp, rough, dark edge that's able to kind of um, take control of all these savages in these terms of men and also has this vindictive, um, vengeful, 
a part of her that's able to enact enact revenge on her husband's killer decades after the murder happened. It's an insane, it's an insane, great quality story, right? And these are the things that you would think would be work amazing on a big screen. Like how many actresses could you get that look similar to this lady, uh, Pupeta Maseka? So many, right? Dark haired brunette, uh, really pretty looking. It would look amazing on the big screen. These are stories that you'd love to see uh, profiled more often on the big screen. But instead, they're more worried about making sure the women are able to do jujitsu and take guys down with guns and, and stuff. And I don't know, do all this nut, nutty stuff, and it'd be a, 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 like an entirely um, a, a cast full of women, only geared towards women, and then somehow that's going to be a big box office hit. It's not how it works. I went and watched Girl Strip, not because it was. Um, I went and watched Girl Strip because it was a good movie. And I'm pretty sure Ghost Trip did well in the box office because, yes, it's more steered towards a certain segment of women out there or women in general. But it's also just a quality, um, you know, uh, buddy buddy movie that involves a whole cast of women, right? Going out there and, you know, having a trip together. It's, I think the one is, that that's the one about when the, the girl's about to get married, right? And they go on a hen do. It's amazing because you know they're going to fall out. You know they're going to make up. You know it's going to be a story about them realizing what friendship is. And it's done in a very clever and interesting way, not heavy handed. And un the underlying line that ties it all together, it's a good movie. So I'd love to see that profile more often. And again, I don't know if it's something that some of these premium directors don't really want to touch or they don't really know about, but I'd love to see them pull some of these stories out, even from like ancient um, history or folklore. You can find loads of really cool, interesting uh, feminine figures that you can kind of um, take apart and basically frame a story around them, even kind of take them into modern history or take them back into time. I think it worked really well. So yeah, I would love to see that happen more often. Again, pretty bummed about Charlie's Angels. And again, you know, for, for Hollywood, if you flop a couple of times, your movie doesn't do well in the box office, you don't get other chances because, you know, the backers, the money men don't really want to, you know, waste their money in that respect. So I, I feel bad for Elizabeth Banks in that respect. But I think next time around, if she's able to develop and produce her own film independently, it might make more sense to kind of go into the, arc, the, the, the history books or the library and pull out some really um, cool... Um, stories that would kind of further the women's movement without being too heavy-handed and without turning into some pastiche or parody of itself in terms of like batwoman or something right you don't want that so maybe that happens going forward but you never know fingers crossed and hopefully it works out but yeah um, i like all the attitude behind saying you know wearing the loss on the sleeve i don't like this idea that if if men don't watch it it means that we're, we're, we're kind of reinforcing this idea that men don't go watch movies with movement in it. it doesn't make any sense if it's a good movie i'll watch it if it's a bad movie i won't watch it simple as i don't care who's in it and i think even um I think some of the movies that Kevin Hart and The Rock does is a good example about it, right? They're usually quite terrible movies, but they have a great cast of people in it. If 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 it was just about the people, they would those movies would make millions and millions of dollars all the time, all the way around, but they don't. Will Smith movies are the same way. He's very successful, very popular. But if the movie isn't good, people won't go and watch it. Simple. So it needs to be a good movie. But you know, what